What's up my friends, welcome back, you're watching Hard Video Order Stuff. Recently I've changed the way that I film these videos, my setup, so I thought it'd be interesting to show you what I'm doing for my video setup and then lighting setup and then how I colour grade it. It's evolved so much over time, I just hope this will inspire you or help you in some way. Anyway, time for me to shut up and roll the intro. <laughs> As ever, all the gear mentioned in this video I will link in the description box below, you can find it all there. And be sure to show some love for the channel, this isn't sponsored content, so if you could hit the notification bell by your subscribe button, that just makes a huge difference to the channel and I appreciate it. Thank you. Starting with my camera, and nowadays I'm using almost exclusively a Sony a7S III. It's a camera that I waited for a long time to come out and obviously I pre-ordered it. Now that it's here and I feel like I know it back to front, inside out, I can tell you it is a gigantic step up from the a7S II, which was already a really great video camera. The combination of now having 10-bit codecs, the giant improvement in colour science and the new improved autofocus really adds up to what I consider the best pure video camera in this form factor. It's not a hybrid, even though the stills are actually pretty lovely from the a7S III, but the Canon R5 is, and that style camera are definitely better hybrids. But yeah, the a7S III, bang in video camera. I shoot these videos in S-Log3 and all the time I get people asking why. Why do you shoot in S-Log3? You don't need that extra dynamic range. Also, why do you shoot S-Log3 when it takes forever to color grade? Well, let me answer all those questions because I think S-Log3 is misunderstood. Regarding the dynamic range, even though this shot is actually surprisingly dynamic, it's not actually the dynamic range in the shadows and highlights that I'm trying to tap into. This is the first reason why I love S-Log3. I love to use curves to sculpt the contrast in my footage, and that's just something you can't do with Cine 1 or Cine 4 or whatever you like. So if I turn my curves off, it looks like this. It still looks good, a bit more contrast. And then when I turn it back on, it looks like this. You can't be too aggressive with the way that you manipulate the curves, but I love it. I'll show you exactly what I did with this in my grading segment I'll do at the end of the video, or I would recommend definitely watching the video about how to use curves to your benefit, which I'll link here. The other thing I think is misunderstood about S-Log3 is that people think it's hard to grade, and I might agree if you're dealing with an older camera with an 8-bit codec, but with the new 10-bit codecs in the a7S III, plus with all of those amazing lookup tables you can get that do a lot of the heavy lifting for you, it's just ridiculously easy. My favourite lookup tables for grading S-Log3 are the Phantom Array LUTs, which I'm using now, and the Velocore lookup table, which needs some extra contrast tweaks, but they're still great in terms of colour and the Alistair Chapman Venice lookup tables. They're all great, they're all linked below. Check them out. Anyway, that's why I use S-Log3. It's a whole the question I could flip on its head and say, well, why wouldn't you use it when the linear profiles are comparatively inflexible and comparatively have so little dynamic range, and when S-Log3 is actually really easy to grade these days? What do you think? My lens of choice for this angle is the brilliant Sony 20mm f1.8, which I reviewed recently, really liked it. Again, it's linked here if you want to check that out. If you've got limited space to work with, I really like the field of view you get with this lens, plus you've got that maximum aperture of f1.8, so it gives you a nice background separation. It also focuses silently, you get great colour, contrast and detail from it. The only tiny niggle I have is that I don't think it's the best value for money lens that you can buy. For my lighting, I'm using the Aperture C300, which I've got just up here. I'm using the Light Zone Mini on the front, and I tend to prefer it with the honeycomb attached. That way you get still the diffused light, but it's a bit more directional. Uh, I really like the control you get with it. All of the higher end aperture lighting is just so bright that, I mean, this one I have to have around 50%, otherwise it's just too bright. The a7S III is just so damn sensitive to light. Plus, with the lens I've got on, which I like to have almost wide open, it be it's just really easy to overexpose. Also, I like to have my key light not so bright because I like to have a good balance of the way that I'm exposed with the background. I'm just going to turn it off and show you exactly what it's doing. Ready? There we go. 
I also have a combined hair and fill light, which I've got just up here. And for that, I'm using an Aperture Amaran LED panel on its lower setting with the slot-in diffuser. I like having a small amount of soft glow just to fill in a few of the shadows and for a little bit to be on my head just to give me further separation from the background. I've just switched it off. That's what it does. That's what it looks like without it. And back on. I definitely prefer it when it's on. A lot of people have asked me about this neon panel since I got it. It's from a company called Custom Neon and they're based in Australia, however, they ship worldwide. Instead of them making an actual neon glass bulb, which is expensive and they can break, they use neon effect tubing, which is way more wallet friendly and much more reliable. Just to be clear, I'm not in any way affiliated with them. I just did a lot of research before pulling the trigger on this one um, and I just found them to be the best value. So went with that, they're good. One thing I would advise when using a light like this is to do a custom white balance on your camera using something like this uh, gray card. Otherwise, it can cause some pretty weird things with your colour. I recently did a video with some helpful custom white balance tips, which I will link here for you. It makes a huge difference to the shot. Let me turn it off now. Yeah, there we go. Not as good, in my opinion. Bring it back. That tip also definitely applies to my next accent light, which is this big Edison bulb just over my shoulder. I've had it for a little while now, and I still really like it. I really like the blue on this side fading into the tungsten on that side. I got it from Amazon and from what I remember you had to buy the stand and the bulb separately but that's fine. One thing to bear in mind is it is deceptively powerful so too high and it makes it starts to make everything look a bit tungsten. This is on and then off. It's somehow lacking depth. Let's turn it back on quickly. The final accent light I have you'd be forgiven for never even noticing because it's tucked away behind my computer and it's just a single strip of soft but warm LED lights. It just gives you gentle illumination and all I know is I miss it when it's off so I keep it on. Anyway that's my lighting so now let me show you my grading process for this shot. So in Final Cut now and the first thing I'm going to do is drop on an adjustment layer. This is a free plugin, it's not something that comes with Final Cut, but if you just search for it, adjustment layer for Final Cut Pro, you'll find a free version, no problem. I just find it a much tidier way to apply plugins, much in the same way you would do it in Premiere Pro. So I'm going to drop on my plugins in this order, color wheels, color curves, and then believe it or not, two instances of custom lookup table, I will explain why. Actually the first thing I do to this is I apply a lookup table and then I grade into it. I like the Phantom Lutz Utopia lookup table and I'm using the Legacy version. Although it's somewhat more stylized than a conversion lookup table, that's the way I'm using it. It does add lots of color, lots of contrast, but all will make sense. So now I'm going to start making some color adjustments and I'm going to start by just dipping my highlights a little bit and I'm going to warm it up just a little bit. I know it looks fairly magenta at the moment, but we will fix that, don't worry. One thing I like to do with my color and a way that I actually balance it is to give it a tiny touch of that orange and teal kind of look, but not so that it's obvious and overdone. As you can see, I'm pushing my mid-tones into that orange and I'm balancing it by dragging my shadows towards teal. It's actually a brilliant way of balancing your colors without using the color temperature or tint controls. And this is what I ended up with once I'd played with it a little bit. Next I'm going to move on to looking at my color curves. I demonstrated this earlier in the video and it's what I would consider probably the greatest contributing factor to my style. Notice I placed this second in my chain of plugins and I've created lots of control points and I'm just going to work from the shadows all the way up to the highlights and just adjust and try and extract the most amount of detail that I can. This is what I was talking about when I was talking about extracting the most amount of dynamic range from S-Log3. You just need to always remember to position your curves before you apply your lookup table. And this is what I ended up with, nothing too extreme. You really don't want to push and pull those control points too much. And now for my current secret weapon. And you remember how I mentioned that I use the phantom lookup tables, almost like conversion lookup tables? Well, it's at this stage that I add more style. So you can consider my log to Rec 709 conversion stage done. I love using a little bit of the Triune Films Harry Potter lookup table, but the one that's designed for Rec 709 footage. At full strength, it looks pretty ridiculous, but as soon as you start dialing it back, it really starts to make sense with your footage. I love how this looks. I find the sweet spot to be around 40 to 50% and I just love it. If I just switch it on and off like this, you can see the effect it has. Big, big fan of this and 
that's pretty much it. Love to hear your thoughts about this in the comments section. Remember, there's no right or wrong with grading. No, really, there isn't. And the last thing I like to do is add a subtle vignette. And whilst I don't mind the one that's built in, I definitely prefer the vignette plugin from FCPFX, and I'll link it below. It's probably the best one I've ever used. Just look at the amount of control you have. In this case, I'm just gonna keep it simple and drop the brightness a little bit. It just has a really nice softness to it. Some of them I find way too harsh. So there we have the before, and then the after and nothing too crazy. That's how I'm doing it at the moment. Anyway, that's it for now. You can ask me questions about this setup if you want to in the comments section below. I just hope you found this interesting and helpful. I've got a large back catalog of videos about videography on this channel of which YouTube has handpicked this video for you and the one below is my most recent upload. Until next time, let's help each other out and shoot a bit of video. See you guys. Just hang in